you. All right, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I am very honored and humbled to have someone who I have immense respect for because his push for the truth about this particular case has shown, and I say this uh, not to blow smoke up your ass because you're here, uh, brother, in this call, but there's just been a tremendous amount of resilience that uh, our, our great uh, guest, and I could probably uh, can call a friend, Ashton here, has shown against a lot of people that seem to want to detract or anything of the sort from uh, basically asking questions that he has now asked and shown on places like, for example, uh, Infowars. On I think you'll be going on. You said on Alex Jones, you'll be heading on Tim Pool pretty soon, um, and you're really you're really going all over the place and rightfully so and that's great to see and hear because uh, we know for example as well there's six figures out there for anyone that can debunk or disprove any of what you're investigating but clearly there has not been a situation that has shown conclusively that the the evidence of any of what we're, we're about to discuss and look at is fake by any means and i will say as well that i am uh proudly biased uh towards supporting ashton's case because of the fact that i am familiar with experiments in the laboratory that behave identically to what we are seeing in this footage here so without further ado uh ashton brother thank you so much for coming on the show today and it's great to have you and i'm sure my audience is uh has seen you around all over the place whether it's x or all you know all these different platforms Platforms, but um very happy to have you on uh, the Gen Z show with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Dave, for having me on here. And thanks for your audience for listening to the evidence with an open mind. I'm really looking forward to going through it with you guys and then talking about the technology that we see and what some of those implications might be. So ready Absolutely. to get to it. Absolutely. So if you don't mind, as we discussed, yeah. if you could just lay out a general uh, sort of a case for those that may not be as familiar as to what happened on the MH370 flight and sort of what uh, what's going on in that sense. And then we'll go into more of a discussion into the details after. Yeah, sure. So I think the best way is if I pull up a flight path that we created and I'll kind of speak to the official narratives and where our theories and stories uh, kind of separate from those. Sure. So what we're looking at here is this flight path was created by Chris of the Not So Deep podcast. Um, he created this animator for us. Now we can see this plane takes off at 1642 UTC. And I'm going to refer to the times in UTC times, but 1642 is going to be 1242 AM. So it's going to be dark at the time when this plane's taking off. It's headed to Beijing. And it's going to be flying for about 40 minutes until it gets over here to what we call the Igari Waypoint. Now, at 1719 UTC is when this final communication happens. This final communication is reported publicly. And this is where the pilots say, good night, Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. There's no kind of uh, alarm in their voice. We don't hear anything going off in the background. 64 seconds later, this entire plane goes dark. The official narrative here, this is where it starts to become a little bit discombobulated in the days after the event. You know, So I was... Uh, I followed this event back then, and we couldn't tell exactly where, when this plane went missing, dark, when it disappeared, et cetera. What we know now, 10 years later, is this is when the plane went dark, but it did not disappear at this point. The plane turns around here and heads towards Penang Macau International Airport. Military radar picks it up. The Malaysian Minister of Defense is on the record saying that this plane was unidentified, but that somehow... They knew this was a civilian airliner and they knew it wasn't hostile, which is very important to note because some of the most prominent theories were that this was hijacked or that this plane was a uh, the pilot was taking on some kind of suicide route, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. The Malaysia Minister of Defense also uh, tries to argue against why they didn't send jets up to track the plane. Now, if it's an emergency event, then you're not going to send jets up because you know we don't, you know you know what's going on with the plane you know it's not a risk if this plane was hijacked then you definitely need to be sending jets up to either track the plane or potentially in the worst case scenario to shoot it down before it crashes into some buildings especially in a post 9/11 world now the plane gets to penang this is the logical location for the plane to go to in an emergency scenario it's slightly closer than kuala lumpur the elevation changes are better for a plane in this scenario and there's a Wired article that's out there that says that in an electrical fire, this would be the correct lo location to go to. You would pull the buses so that the plane's going to go dark and you're going to try to figure out exactly where the damage to the plane is from an electrical fire. Right. Now, the plane does not land in Penang for whatever reason. We can only speculate the exact reason. One plausible reason would be that this has only been about 30 minutes here and 
the air traffic control, the radar systems, this is like a weak point when the plane went dark here in Agari. So it could be that the situation was that they, uh, they didn't know what was going on with the plane. Military was tracking it, but perhaps the communications hadn't gone to the airport that this plane was coming in. And if so, the runway lights could have been off, especially in a third world country, 2 a.m. The airport is essentially closed. It's, it's probably open for emergencies, but right. unless you have direct communication, it's going to be dark. And we checked the moon phase and the sun phase and you know sunset, et cetera. The moon was down. The sun was obviously down to two in the morning. So there was no light whatsoever. So trying to land here in the dark would have been d disastrous. Um, if you've read, read Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point, a lot of the reason why planes would crash is because they wouldn't be able to figure out where the runway actually was. Sometimes there's these beacons that say, oh, it's over here, but that's not always accurate. Um, and then for miscommunication problems is the next one. But that's aside the point. The other possibilities, if there was a fire on board this plane, then it could have been that the landing gear was damaged to some degree for the same reason why the plane went dark. It could be that they were unable to dump fuel uh, because if they dump the fuel, the plane's on fire, might be too high of a risk. Uh, the next thing you're supposed to do if you can't land those, you're supposed to try to land on your belly uh, with this plane. But again, landing on your belly to me seems extremely dangerous. I mean, the plane's going to rip apart. If it's filled with fuel, it's going to explode. So those are our most likely scenarios for why it doesn't land there. Now, after that, the next thing you're supposed to do is land in the ocean, land in the water, so, do a Sully Sullenberger. The problem with landing in the ocean is it's not like landing in the Hudson River. Hudson River is a very narrow river compared to the ocean, very wide. The waves in the Hudson River are much less, much more calm than if you were in the ocean where the plane's going to get ripped apart. There's a video out there showing a plane trying to land in the ocean where it, the moment the wing touches the water, it just rips apart, goes into a barrel roll. Everything just gets destroyed, essentially. So this is a very scary event, potentially, for this plane trying to land in the ocean here now. Now, because of this Malaysian Minister of Defense communication, where they say that they knew the plane was not hostile, I think we have to assume that there was a communication with this plane and that they have, only, they have classified that information, not revealed it to the public, and only revealed the communication at 1719, which was only released later on under immense pressure from the families because the families knew something was wrong with the official story. Now, we know this plane keeps going. It's on military radar. The official narrative uh, agrees that this plane loses military radar at 1822 UTC or 1815 UTC. They're, they're actually somewhat inconsistent about that as well. About 230 miles off the coast of Penang in the Malacca Straits here in the Andaman Sea um, as it approaches our Nicobar Islands. Now, if you go look at March 9th or March 8th, the day this plane went missing, the official news reports all say that air traffic control lost communication with the plane at 1840 UTC, which is actually 18 minutes later, which puts it over here where we see this boat over here. This here at 1840 UTC is the same location. The official narrative says this plane takes a sharp turn into the South Indian Ocean. And this is based only on Immerstat pings, which are pings to a satellite. Satellites over here in the Indian Ocean somewhere, and it's pinging this plane. And so after the radar, we don't have any idea where it went. And this is where the arc comes into play. They supposedly know the distance from the plane to the satellite, but they don't know what direction it went. So this is why you have people like Jeff Wise claiming this plane went to Russia, which doesn't make any sense because there's all kinds of radars that would have caught it if it went to Russia. So they just come up with the conclusion it must have gone south into the South Indian Ocean. And the official narrative says that this plane flies for another six hours into the South Indian Ocean, just going on a joyride out there. They also sorry, then try I, to come... Sorry, I, I, forgive me, I don't mean to cut you off, but just to clarify, the official narrative is that the plane just, hey, it just went on for six hours? Like, Yep, went on for six hours. That somehow they had uh, depressurized the plane so that nobody was fighting back, that they had locked these people out of the cockpit and there's no way in there, supposedly. Now, I've looked into it, and there's like four different ways to get into the cockpit. Not only so, even if it has one of these reinforced doors after 9 11, right. which they uh, implemented, which yeah. I'm not sure it really did because right. the construction of this plane was in 2002 um, and 9 11 was 2001. So it seems like a very narrow window of time to improve, uh, put those improved doors in there. Right. But there's also an electric over or a elect keypad override, which the pilot can technically like disable or like make it so it doesn't go in there, but it like you have to keep doing it over and over and over and over again. 
Mm. If the plane gets depressurized, panels actually blow out from the cockpit as well, I learned, to equalize the pressure between the cockpit and the passenger side as well. Gotcha. Uh, Jeff Wise, once again, actually argued that there is a computer system that can be accessed that could also theoretically override the electronics in, in the uh, in the airplane. So it's really hard for me to believe that after eight hours, no one was able to get in. It's also pretty hard for me to believe that they were able to disable everybody, the crew and the passengers for this eight hour joyride. Um, most suicide uh, plane crashes, if not all of them, uh, happen within just minutes after the person has taken control of the plane. Mm. Um, the most common one that people know is the German Wings 2015 incident where the pilot locks out the co-pilot and crashes the plane in nine minutes afterwards. So they pretty much just immediately start descending and crash it into a mountain. If this was a pilot suicide narrative, they would have crashed it over in the South Indian Ocean or the South China Sea, right where it goes dark. They're not going to be flying it over the closest airport that you can go to in an emergency situation and then out here over the Nicobar Islands and then turning down into the uh, South Indian Ocean. Right. If they were going to the South Indian Ocean, they would have gone straight there. They're not going to make this roundabout. So mm. this is where the official narrative starts to break down. And the strongest evidence against this plane crashing into the South Indian Ocean is that there was no debris field found. This is why everybody started coming up with these alternative theories, because you can't have a 777 crash into the ocean without a debris field. It's just not possible at all. Right. No one can even refute this. Um, even on a controlled descent, this plane is going to rip apart. There's going to be right. bodies, luggage, pieces of the plane everywhere. We're going to yeah. see it from satellites from space. Right. Just like we saw the the Russian Wagner guy's jet. We <laughs> actually there's like videos of it like being destroyed, and you know we found the debris the next day. Well, with that we one, there everything lined up. Like you said, you see the jet either on radar, on the online map, or in, in on the videos just being blown up. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we should have seen this plane the next day if it had crashed in the South Indian Ocean. It was the most expensive and extensive search in human history for looking for a plane. Included 39 planes and or 49, 42 planes and 39 boats from over 10 different countries that were searching. Um, there was no black boxes found. They search along this arc in the South Indian Ocean and uh, they don't find anything. They find no black boxes down there. The black boxes have a depth of up to 20,000 feet. So it's not too deep that they can't find these black boxes. Right. Uh, acoustic detections travel further in water anyway. So it really should have been easy to find them. And they send out a signal that's at a very specific frequency, which makes it so that they should be able to find them and, and be able to distinct them, uh, distinguish them from anything else that's out there. Right. There's three different acoustic systems that would have heard the plane crash as well. They would have been able to pinpoint it. The number one is the Sosa system. The same one that heard this Titan sub pop out there back a few months ago in uh, near the Titanic. The Navy lied about like, well, they didn't say that they had heard it for five days. Well, everybody's wondering yeah. how much oxygen these people have left. Right. They had yeah. it pinpointed the exact location. They go down there and pick up all the debris within like one day after they was, finally admit. Thank you for bringing that up because I was going to ask you, uh, basically, w would there not have been some type of mechanism either identical or similar to the acoustic one that we saw, for example, with the Titanic implosion that could have you been used in this case, for example? Yeah. Yep. And so, you know, if they had heard this system had already been declassified back in like 2012. So right. this system should have 100 percent heard it. Uh, I fully believe that the Navy can hear any acoustic sounds anywhere in the ocean. Um, based on this system. So they kind of gave away the details here with this. And maybe we couldn't even know what really happened to this plane without all these details up until now in 2023. There's two other systems as well. So there is the Australia has Western, uh, Western, Western Australia has hydrophones. And actually Diego Garcia has hydrophones as well. Both would have been in range to hear acoustic detections of the plane crashing into the South Indian Ocean. Neither of them do. The Diego Garcia data was actually released and people have analyzed it. And there is nothing that represents a, a crash into the South Indian Ocean there. Then there's the radar systems. And I'm actually going to be adding another one to my list here now that from our investigation yesterday. Like this thing has started to pick up recently and more and more people are out there investigating. And I can barely even keep up with all the new stuff coming out there. But Indonesia's radar system should have picked up the plane going to the South Indian Ocean. India actually has a radar system. They have bases in uh, Blair, Port Blair and in Car Nicobar. And we think actually the drone was deployed from one of these two stations as well, that the U.S. has joint U.S.-India control at these bases. So they should have seen this plane turning the South Indian Ocean and know exactly where it went. The United States actually stopped helping in the search after like a month. 
Like as if they just like knew that it was a futile search, right? Everybody else searches for three years. United States is like, nah, we're good with it. Um, it's an active shipping route in the South Indian Ocean. It goes from Africa to Australia. The official narrative has the plane crashing in the morning in the daylight hours. How are there no witnesses that see the plane? Nobody sees the plane down there in the South Indian Ocean. There's no debris field again found on this active shipping route, which they should have seen it pretty easily, any of these boats nearby. And even if you can cover things up from the military perspective, you can't cover up all these random people that would have seen it, right? Just like with how all these witnesses that I'll go into were discredited. Um, the official narrative has it running out of fuel. So people say, well, the ocean's really big, everybody. Yeah, well, it's not like it went to the Atlantic Ocean or something like that, at least not by conventional means. Uh, you know, there's nowhere else for it to have gone. They searched where it has, where the, path, the plane, the path of the plane goes with fuel exhaustion. Uh, it couldn't go any further. They searched literally everywhere along the entire seventh arc above water and below water using submarines or these like autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, the official narrative says that it did originally very early on that it did some kind of 90 degree swan dive, which isn't even possible for a plane to pull off. And even if you did, it's like crashing into the water in a 90 degree swan dive. Isn't going to have you just like break through the surface tension of the water. It's going to make the plane explode. And then there's going to be debris everywhere. Later on, very quietly, I don't even think it was reported other than like I found articles about it. They changed it to a 14 degree angle and descent. And this again is going to have the plane ripping apart into pieces. Ironically, they actually argued that this is why this flapper on has this breakage line on the flapper on that they end up ends up washing up later on. But what they don't then talk about is how there should have been like hundreds of pieces of plane and, and stuff like that around, which we found nothing. There's four redundant emergency transponder beacons. Um, and none of these go off. They only are supposed to go off during a crash. Four of them redundant all over the plane. So we don't have any other redundant ELT beacons going off. We have 19 families of the victims signing a statement saying they could call the victim's cell phones for up to four days after the event, which if you, yeah, if you tell me like, okay, maybe one or two or like, are somehow there's a ring or something, I'd say, okay, that's, that's one thing. But when you have 19 of them saying it, and one of them proves it on TV where I, I posted this on my Twitter of the video of the phone ringing, you know, they had some CNN expert come on and be like, oh, well, this is happening because it's uh, touching the last tower that it hit. Like, uh, okay, well, first of all, the, Cell towers don't even go out into the ocean down there. We looked into it and found out that your phone will die in salt water in like less than Sorry, 15. I don't mean to cut you off, Ashton, but just I, I ask this very speculatively, but is, sure. does this imply that if, let's just say, if we were to go with this teleportation theory or notion that potentially the occupants may have been alive longer than we had thought relative to the official narrative? Well, at least the cell phones were still there. Now, I don't know. Right. I don't like to give anybody false hope out there. The right. scenario that we're going to be presenting here that I'll dig into in a minute is a lithium ion battery fire, which can be billowing toxic smoke for over an hour, as well as a potential depressurization event where the pilots are not trying to asphyxiate uh, the passengers and give them hypoxia. They're trying to keep them alive by flying low enough that they get enough oxygen. It's already a very desperate situation. The plane, again, I think is doomed. And then they also then are going to have to survive this macroscopic uh, quantum coherence event that we see in our videos. So it, it's going to take a lot for people to survive, but it does seem like the phones, wherever they were, were active. They were in a location where they were in range of cell towers, enough where they could get a ring to go off. Um, so there might be some hope, you know, for, for at least some of them to have survived. Um, and yes, so we have these phones still ringing, which is pretty, pretty amazing. I think that how that's just kind of been ignored. And I would imagine that they should have been able to triangulate those or use cell phone tower data to figure that out. But as far as I've dug into in my investigation, we can't find any evidence that they ever looked into any of that. Now, some people then will say, well, what about this debris, Ashton? Like, how could you, you know, what about this debris they found? I heard that some stuff washed up. And I don't think this guy Blaine Gibson is a spy at all. I watched the Netflix documentary like after this. I actually couldn't get through it the first time. I thought it was so awful. But after I, I watched these videos, I'm like, okay, I better, I better take a look at this. And you know, Jeff Wise tries to vilify this guy, and it's just frankly embarrassing for Jeff Wise because this guy is not, he's not a spy, man. Like I, I don't, I don't want to say like I know what spies are like, but this guy's just a d expat who's on the on the beach hanging out, trying to do the right thing, finds a bunch of debris, and is just trying to help out, right? And uh, I don't know how many pieces of this debris actually are really part of MH370. 
What I will say is that according to the most recent reports, only about three of these pieces have been confirmed tied to the plane. What the media doesn't tell you is this flap around. This is the big piece where they were able to like make the whole narrative go away is missing its unique serial plate. So this is a plate that's like bolted on. You can find the articles about how it was missing in a delayed connection to the plane. They end up connecting the piece based on the paint on the plane and a non-unique serial number, which you would say, okay, well, that's still pretty conclusive, except for the fact that GA Telus has purchased an exact replica of MH370 from Malaysian Airlines in October of 2013, less than six months before this plane goes missing. And this company is was started by an ex-military uh, person who was only 34 years old and now somehow just in charge of a multi-billion dollar plane purchasing company. And they scrapped the plane like at least 10 or 20 years too early. These planes lifespan is like 30, 40 years. This plane was only like 10, 15 years old and they're scrapping it. So if we do expect that there is some kind of, they're testing this technology, well then maybe they use this other plane to test it. Maybe they threw this piece in there, but my scenario says this is a fire event, potentially a, um, you know, a macro or a, a super luminal speed event, I will call it instead of teleportation is consistent with the debris that's out there. In fact, some of the debris that was found had burn marks on it that Blaine Gibson found. And that burn mark pieces that the scorch mark pieces that were out there actually had the consistent honeycomb pattern of a Boeing airplane as well. So I think it's perfectly plausible that the tiny amounts of debris, less than 1% of the plane, if you go look at the CNN graphic of it, just a tiny per percentage of the plane, consistent with the being on fire, some pieces falling off, mm. and consistent with it being moved to another location, and then maybe some of this debris being thrown in the ocean later on. Right. Now, um, let's go ahead and I'm going to pull back up this flight path because I want to just now go through it with the witnesses that we have just a little bit quicker than I did last time. Sure. And then I'll show the videos because, you know, people are probably wondering at this point, what, what are these videos we're talking about here? Unless they're familiar. So again, this plane takes off. Now, when it goes dark over here, there's our first witness is about 300 miles on an oil rig, Mike McKay off to the Northeast side of the screen here. And he sees the plane very, low on the horizon because it's so far away. And probably the only reason why he can even see it is because it had just been raining. And when it, after it rains, the sky is very clear and it's a dark night and there's no light pollution. He sees fire for about five to 10 seconds. His sight is misreported. It's him seeing the plane crash when he says, I assume the plane must've crashed because he's seen it so low. And again, it looks like it's low on the horizon from his perspective, but it's really at cruising altitude. At the same time, there's nine witnesses along the coast that hear loud noises consistent with a potential lithium ion battery fire explosion, 221 kilograms of lithium ion batteries in the cargo of this plane. That's about 500 pounds. We looked into them and these things were uh, assembled that day. They missed two security screenings and they were stacked up in a way where people that have looked at them look like it's extremely dangerous and unsafe. This was in 2014, before we knew the huge dangers of lithium ion batteries. The FAA in 2015 went ahead and outlawed lithium ion batteries in the cargo of passenger planes because of situations like this. And you can Google it and you'll find there was a bunch of incidents before this where people died trying to fight the fires, people playing the entire planes burnt up because of these. And it's so dangerous that even now, if you go to the post office to mail just a letter, just paper letter, they have to ask you. What's the spec? What's the what is the spec or the hypothesis for the cause of the fire of the lithium? Yeah. yeah, good question. I personally think that it was probably accidental due to the fact that they missed these security screenings. The most right. common reason why they light up is that there's defects in them. So gotcha. if they were not properly screened and you have these stacked on one another, once one goes up, the right. whole pile is going to go up. And gotcha. if you go look at videos out there, you'll see that even just one of these batteries lighting up in like a scooter or something is an extremely scary event. And when it explodes, there's a localized explosion that occurs as well. Gotcha. Now, it could also be an espionage scenario. I can't rule anything out here. So if for some reason this was set up from the beginning, the U.S. government or whoever was involved, then you could argue that they lit this, this explosion up as a diversion or whatever to force the hand of whatever events are going to follow afterwards. But in my mind, the simplest solution here, simplest explanation is that it was accidental. They didn't know the dangers of these batteries that were out there. Um, they were produced by Motorola. 
who uh, mm-hmm. actually this company, Freescale Semiconductors, split off from Motorola in 2014 or 2004, which will be relevant here in a minute. Um, so we have this nine witnesses on the coast to hear the explosion. Mike McKay sees the plane on fire, sees the fire go out. So this would be consistent with this lithium ion battery fire lighting up. They're battling the fire. The fire goes out. Now you've got smoke billowing everywhere. The fire is going to keep coming back up. They would have to be actively fighting this fire using all the fire suppression devices on board the plane. It would potentially be in a contained cargo bay that's built to withstand these types of fires, um, but it's not going to be able to withstand it forever. Now the plane turns around and this is going to be consistent with the pilot potentially pulling the buses or they're being damaged to the electronics from the explosion and, and subsequent fire. And 10 minutes later, we have a communication that happens, not very widely reported, but there's another 777 pilot who hears the co-pilot or pilot of MH370 with a bunch of static at 1730 UTC, nine minutes after the plane goes dark. He doesn't even want his name to be known. He's probably very afraid that he will lose his job the same way Mike McKay lost his job just for reporting, seeing the plane. There's also 10 or eight fishermen that are off the coast, 10 miles off the coast of Thailand and and Malaysia here. They see the plane flying very low. Uh, And the reason why they would see it flying low is because if it's been depressurized, the pilot's trying to give people enough oxygen to be able to breathe. The moment that plane becomes depressurized, the masks are automatically going to drop. It's not a situation where the pilot controls them and can make them not. They're going to drop. But people are going to be desperately trying to put their masks on, right? And they're going to start succumbing from hypoxia pretty quickly. Those masks are only going to last 25 minutes. I found out that's pretty bad news in terms of those masks are not going to save a lot of people if this plane is flying for over 25 minutes. Now, we already spoke to the Penang situation here. Again, if this is a fire, you're not going to be able to land on your belly safely. You probably can't even dump your fuel safely. Uh, The fuel could ignite and cause a, you know, cascading burn effect and explosion effect. For whatever reason, the pilots most likely did not feel like it was safe there. They may have had communication with the U.S. government sometime around here where they developed a rendezvous point. And it said, here's the rendezvous point over by Catherine T's boat over here in the Nicobar Islands. This is where we will have assets available to fish people out of the water or whatever they tell them. I don't think they told them about the events that we see in our videos. That's just my speculation. I can't say one way or another. And then we get to the point where they claim they lost contact, but we know that seems, un- seems unlikely since the day, right? The, the next day, they, all the reports say it was 1840 UTCs when they really lose contact. Um, there was also a cell phone call at 1839 UTC from the ground to the airplane. But there's only two total cell phone calls, or not cell phone calls, but calls from uh, Malaysian Airlines to the plane. The next one's at 2315. Why would they only call one time through this whole event? And why are they calling at nearly the exact same time where the plane, where we think our videos are happening here? And if they don't have contact, why are they not calling again right after that as well? This is something I'm going to be reporting on uh, probably later tonight or tomorrow. Uh, So this is where Catherine T sees the plane. She sees it glowing orange. She sees it with no navigation lights, indicating there's probably no power still. And she sees it flying very low. She says that the recreation of her sightings is about 10,000 feet and that it's descending during the five to 10 minutes of her sighting. The direction of travel is consistent with where the plane actually came from. Everybody agrees she's underneath the, the plane route at the right time. She tells me directly what time, I ask her, what time do you think your sighting was around roughly? 1840 UTC is what she tells me. She tells me she felt pressured by the other experts that investigated to change her time to fit with their narratives. Yeah, she told me that first, and it blew me away when she told me that. Before we even, just so you know, by the way, even if there was no footage, there's already like 55 like WTF points, by the way, since you started. So yeah, yeah. And this is why when I spoke to Danny Jones and he said, well, how how important is the footage? I said, at this point, the footage isn't even that important anymore. I feel like we've already put together a a story that makes more sense than anything else already. We're just without looking at it. If I can say very quickly, I just want to emphasize to both uh, my audience for members and for the public when this comes out, the, and I want to be very clear in what I'm about to say here i'm not claiming as if it's fact but if there was a potential case where the lithium ion batteries were possibly um set on set ablaze in order to uh we could say stimulate or shape the outcome of what was to follow from that event it would not surprise me particularly given the 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 way that what we call direct energy weapons behave 
I don't think it would really take much to use one to set any any set of batteries on fire for that matter. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened, to be clear. But if that is a, a potential hypothesis, I would be I would adamantly not rule it out. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is like the first major conspiracy that I've ever had to dig into. But uh, a lot of people do mention direct energy weapons, which maybe I'll have to look into that after all of this. Um, so she sees the plane consistent with what we're going to have seen in our videos. So we've got this eyewitness who's right there and she's been discredited or just dismissed, uh, which blows my mind because when I realize that this glowing orange plane is consistent with the Halon fire extinguishing devices, having a chemical reaction, releasing bromine, a halogen gas. I thought, wow, this makes way more sense than everything else everybody's put forth. And that's when I actually went back and looked at the other witnesses, the ones we've already talked about. So in the way that we investigated this, we went kind of went backwards from how I've described it. And that's how we realized, oh, wow, everybody saw the same thing. Like all these people heard the same thing. They heard the explosion of lithium ion battery fires. I didn't even realize how dangerous they were until about a month ago. And then I started looking up the videos of these lithium ion batteries. And I'm like, wow, like they smoke, they explode. They smoke more. You try to put them out. They just come back up again. It's called runaway lithium ion battery fires that they have a ton of energy in them. And this is why they just keep coming back up and up and up. The example I give the analogy is like these uh, candles, these joke candles that you get on your birthday where you blow it out and then it just keeps coming back up again. It's much like that when you watch the videos, very dangerous, scary events. So this plane's glowing orange because this halon gas, this uh, halogen gas, this bromine is permeating throughout the plane potentially even leaking out of the plane from any holes or vents that the, is in this plane. And that's why she sees this hazy glow halo effect around the plane. Now she goes into their boat uh, for whatever reason. I think this is the most uh, kind of interesting part about her sighting is that she was having like an emotional situation with her husband on the boat. And for whatever reason, she goes back inside the boat for a few minutes to put the kettle on. And apparently that's the thing that British people do. Um, and then she comes back out and the plane is gone right? The plane is just gone. All there is is a glowing orange halo where no plane whatsoever. She doesn't see any orbs, um, which we're going to show here in the videos in just a minute. And this to me was some of the strongest evidence for what was really going on. Now we also went ahead and we started mapping satellites. Uh, we had some MH370 experts go through the publicly available trajectories of all the satellites out there. And at the same time, I was looking for satellites that might have a satellite pair because the satellite video that we've seen in the Mastery 70 videos is a side-by-side -side stereoscopic, meaning there's two different camera angles. So I'm like, well, it can't be two different satellites from different trajectories because you wouldn't be able to have it lined up like that. You need one that has two satellites right next to it. And roughly around the same time, we come across USA-229. That's what we're seeing here. NRL-34 is the launch of these satellites. We can see the time at the top of the screen. We can see them approaching 1840 UTC, and there is our satellite coordinates. And this is about a, a 1,000 kilometer diameter. From looking at the Sivers video on how the space-based infrared system works, we actually think that these can map thousands of kilometers in terms of just pulling data. And I'll show that in a second. How do you, how do you investigate like this, man? I know that you're, you're <laughs> humbly, I know you're impressed with how my mind works, but how does your, I can't do that. How do you do this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. It's, I guess from my analytical background in healthcare IT, like this, my job has always been to take workflows from providers, from right. nurses and to figure out knowing what we know about our computer, how our system works, how does that fit into the system to make an efficient process for them? So, you know, gotcha. if, if there is any skill set that has helped me, it's probably doing that and visualizing that and then taking all these clues and visualizing how does this fit together to the story, right? right? And so right. This, this satellite pair is by far the best explanation for where the data comes from, from our videos. Now, immediately we had people trying to debunk this, claiming, okay, well, yes, they're in the right exact location staring down, which to me is a huge, just smoking gun. Like the United States clearly knows what happened to this plane. Your satellites are staring right at it. The purpose of these satellites is literally tracking boats, planes, and, and missiles as well. So it's like, it's the exact mission statement of these satellites as well. Um, and this is again, the location of this turn into the South Indian Ocean. So if they knew the plane turned into the South Indian Ocean, because they've got their satellites staring at it, why did the United States give up the search so quickly? And why do I have the Malaysian Minister of Defense literally on record the, being asked, U.S. spy satellites were over the regions. Are you in contact with them? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, 
here they are. Uh, so, I mean, what, what's the deal here? Um, and then, so people said, well, the satellites are moving really quick. These are low earth orbit satellites here. They're moving at 16,000 miles an hour. They circumvent the earth every 90 minutes, which actually means they have to be able to see in the dark because otherwise they're going to be useless half the time. Uh, so then we end up finding, okay, we find out about the Sibir system. I didn't know any of this stuff existed, by the way, beforehand. It's not like we were able to piece this together. We're literally just Sherlock Holmes in this one thing at a time here. And it just and so we, happens, by the way, to add to your point and to support your work, that these, sure, these, these quote unquote, I don't want to say coincidences, but these things that you keep finding that keep coming up just so happen to cohesively fit into the theory or the investigation of this disappearance. Yep, exactly. Right. And that's the part right. where it becomes even more compelling to me. I could have never anticipated we would find so much evidence right. that all lines up towards a comprehensive story right. that by, fits the facts far better than anyone else's theories to date. Right. And so this is now the Sibir system. Look at this. This is when I'm like, okay, global persistent surveillance monitoring. Just think about those words for a minute. Global persistent surveillance monitoring. This means they are mapping the whole world all the time. And these are the geostationary satellites that are about 40,000 kilometers away. These are your millennia orbit satellites, which are your command and relay satellites using the SIGINT system, signals intelligence, that relays data between satellites, between the drone and the satellite, between people on the ground, and forgive me, Ash, I don't mean to cut you off, brother, but I just want to make a very clear point to the Please. audience, which is that this is one of the things, and this was something I was saving to actually say after you finished the, the your presentation here, which is great, by the way, but I feel compelled to let everyone know this is exactly what I feared in terms of if this type of tech has uh, or science or knowledge, if it stays suppressed. And what I mean by that is it's gotten to the point where the technology and the science has become so advanced that I have seen certain cases on uh, social media platforms where people are still debating as to whether or not any country in the world, let alone the US, has the ability to surveil and monitor the the, the planet 24-7. There are people saying that's not possible when, in <laughs> fact, this is extremely old technology that can, to the point where even going all the way back to, very, to the Warren Commission hearings, it was admitted that they could see using satellites the little, you know, quarter centimeter inch of snow that falls on the statue outside of the Soviet Union uh, uh, spy agency buildings. So what I'm trying to say is the fact that people are still debating as to whether the satellite tech or that tech exists or not is what really unfortunately saddens me because they're very likely not going to be open to the possibility of what we're going to discuss shortly in the videos but this is one of the things that bothers me about suppression because people are now debating as to whether or not 60 year old tech works so sorry for cutting you off there but oh, no, I just, you're fine yeah i think it, what you just said sounds great especially with this plane in the background as well because I mean, look at how big these scans are too. It's way bigger than that little bubble I was showing earlier. These scans are scanning huge right. swaths of the globe all the time. Right. I like the end the best. We never oh, forget who my. we're working for, Lockheed Martin. Lockheed that... Martin, if I'm guessing anybody's in charge of these orbs we're seeing in this video in a minute, it's, it's going to be Lockheed Martin. Everything ties back to these guys. Yeah. Yeah, never, we never forget who we're working for. This is yeah. just straight up Hail Hydra right here. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. know how, this is what I think of every single I, time I read this. This is such a weird mission statement. And the so when the satellite got put up in our satellite video, which I'll go ahead and pull it up right now, we can see in the bottom right that there, it's very hard to see in this version of it, but there is a satellite designation that says NROL-22. That is the launch that present that presumably started the Sibir system, going from the old system, which was called the DSP system, Defense Space Program, I think is what the old one was called. And then they moved on to the Sibir system, which is presumably what we're seeing here in this side-by-side -side stereoscopic footage. Right. And this is how they're able to remove the atmospheric interference. This is a Google Earth video playback that they have in real time. Right. The reason why it's jerky, why you see the six frames per second, it's because there's a much bigger field of view that we're seeing. This is just the cropped field of view. And it's producing real-time video playback over a huge area. So it's a computer program that's taking all this data from the satellites in real time and generating this battlefield view so that somebody can be sitting in an airplane relaying information to command about right. here's the plane, here's a boat, et cetera, right? right. They've right. cropped out the drone in this, in this version here. We can see these coordinates mm -hmm. in the bottom left. They actually only move when the perspective of the video moves. 
we're going to see a mouse come over the, the screen from outside the screen, again, indicating that we're looking at a cropped field of view. That mouse as well is going to be proof that what we're looking at is a Citrix session logged into the actual SPI satellite database. Anyone who's worked at a large company is going to know that Citrix sessions are used for tunneling into a remote database. And in addition to this, the person that is recording this is not using a camera. They are actually doing straight up screen recording here. So this person got caught. This information is going to be logged. There's no way that it's not going to be the moment the military sees or even has a hint that data was leaked from their system. They're going to be able to trace it back and figure out who the person was that did this. It's not like they took a cell phone video recording of this, right? Um, and this is when I became very convinced that what we we're seeing was legitimate. We see that mouse right there. Yeah. We see this smoke, which some people have argued maybe it's exhaust, but to me, I don't think exhaust would keep its form the way that it does so uh, well here. And it's not contrails because these clouds are cumulus clouds that only form at low altitudes. So every time someone tries to debunk something, we dig into it and it just ends up authenticating the videos even more. I can see why you're so forthcoming and wanting, encouraging people to to uh, have yeah. conversations with you or others about debunking this because, man, I, I knew you were precise about this investigation. I do, all due respect, I didn't know you were that precise. Like, Yeah, I'm not afraid at all. Like, I mean, every time people try to debunk it, it's like, well, okay, you're just going to be able to prove it further and we're going to figure out something new. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right, right, right. Uh, um, and so we also see this plane. Some people tried to argue, well, the plane can't make this type of turn. It's not consistent, but it's actually perfectly maxing out a 777-200 wall on descent. And from the second video we'll show after this, you'll be able to see that the plane is actually descending as well. So everything matches up. In fact, this is some of the hardest part to fake. We have somebody who posted on Reddit claiming to be a VFX expert from Top Gun Maverick, said that whoever would have created this would have front ran their work by four years and that they had to fake the uh, shots of the plane in those videos because it's really difficult to get them to match their real world capabilities. So now we see these orbs come into effect and now it starts to get, uh, let's call it uh, special. Um, we see this orb come flying in at Mach 3. It's coming in at speeds that are fat, that 10 times, 13 times faster than the plane's moving. The plane's moving 150, 20, 200 miles per hour while it's making this turn because it's slowing down on its turn here. Right. It's consistent with a landing formation over the ocean. Again, that's going to be consistent with what we, uh, what KT saw, what uh, we would expect in terms of this plane trying to land, and uh, intercepted Mayday, only reported in Chinese news at 2.43 a.m., which mm. is 18.43 UTC. They claimed that it was from Malaysian Airlines, that the plane was disintegrating in an attempting emergency landing. So that's also consistent. Now let's watch this. We see the second orb shoot up through the clouds. We see a third orb come in and now they're doing a 120 degree zero point sinusoidal pattern, which you probably know better than me, but this is apparently consistent with some electrical engineering uh, patterns and maybe wave functions. I'm not sure if that's the right term. It's to put consistent in. With, 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 I can go into like 900 different things. Because <laughs> yeah. this is with a lot of science pretty much. Now it looks like it's mapping the plane and then it goes into this ring orientation Right. And then we're going to see the magic happen right here. Oh, perfect pause. Right. So the moment I pause it here, we see this event happen. Now in the IR, it shows up as white because we're looking at a false color IR produced by a computer program produced by Sibbers, which is not showing real color, right? And it's not showing thermal. It's not showing a heat difference as well. We're looking at IR potential radiation here. The clouds here, uh, again, this is nighttime. The clouds near the top show more IR radiation than the clouds near the bottom, which is why they're brighter than the ones behind. Mm. We don't see any shadows anywhere throughout these videos. The plane is going over and past clouds, no shadows anywhere. We don't see any shadows on the ocean from the clouds either, right. indicating that this is nighttime. The zap is accurately illuminating the clouds in the foreground and in the background, and the clouds in the bottom right don't get illuminated at all, which would be very consistent with this zap happening and probably not happening near the daytime because if it was, it most likely wouldn't be as prominent. Now, when the zap goes away, the plane's just gone just in the next frame. Now this was six frames per second. So in under a second, the whole plane is gone. There's this, the smoke trail behind it completely stops. So this is not cloaking because where the, the smoke would be keep going if it was cloaking. Right. And it's not potentially an annihilation event because 
you know, if this was an annihilation event, this, the explosion would be much bigger or the, whatever event is happening here would be much bigger release of energy. Now, some people have argued that there are ways where, uh, I think talking to Bob Green here, that it could be an annihilation event where the byproducts get kind of uh, wormholed to another location where we can't see, but we don't see any like release of vapor. We don't see any other, we don't see it transmute into anything else. I, if, if I could say very quickly, my humble yeah. opinion is that it's, I would I would put my money on a teleportation event. With that said, I do also agree with Mr. Greenier when he says that you can make the internal mass dissipate elsewhere, whether it's into you know the the, the vacuum or to mm -hmm. a completely a separate location entirely. Now, with that said, I again I haven't done nearly as much investigative work into this as you have, but I'm I'm gonna go with person. My personal hypothesis is that, that we're looking at a teleportation event, but that's just me. Yeah. And then the leaker here, so this looks like they this was they pulled up the old recording because if this was in real time. You're not going to have this person come over here and close this window right after, right? right. So this was a, a later recording they pulled back up. They closed the window. The video plays for another minute. Actually, just yesterday, we had people go and change the contrast and you can still see the side-by-side -side box effects that we see here when you go to this later on indicating there's something else still here in the background, still running, but it's just black screen. Like they closed the, the recording, but there's still, there's still like uh, something there, data there behind the scenes or what have you. Right. Um, so this is a very weird thing. If it was hoax, like why do you have this additional recording happening after it being uh, closed in that window? You would expect it to just stop right away. Precisely. Also, when I think, and the other thing I'm going to report here, it happens very quickly, but there is... Um, a user on Reddit uh, actually also noticed that when it closes, it like accurately uh, goes black from the bottom up. And so like the pixelation is consistent with like the window and then the program being closed. So that's also very interesting. There may be a, it's an odd detail that you're putting, yeah. like all these small details are what really makes it hard for these videos to hoax. And the bunkers haven't even come close to kind of debunking that stuff. Right now, I'm going to make a quick pause here, and I want to mention we have a $145,000 bounty put up by Kim.com, who's good for it, as well as the Investigate Earth podcast, which they showed me the numbers and the downloads of the. I've done a three part series with them. Each one has over a million downloads, 1.6 million on the most recent one that I did with them. So they're wow. good for the 20,000 that they have put up as well. And then I talked to a wealthy donor who's run for a uh, higher office. There's a follower of mine and a supporter of the work, and they've put up another 25000 So there's a real $145,000 bounty for anyone who can find the supposed hoaxer of these masterpieces right. and produce this source material, right? Because if you made these with these level of detail, it's not like you made it exactly perfect on the final try, right? You would have had all these work that you would have done to piece it all together while you were trying to put it together. Multiple, in other words, multiple sessions to refine it. Exactly. Yeah. So if they can bring that work and prove that they did that with the timestamps on those files, going back to 2014, there's $145,000 in them for it. That's a pretty big incentive in my mind. Right. Plus I, I imagine they can get a job at any studio they want out there. If they, I mean, they can and produce this stuff, you know, get get a job with Top Gun Maverick or whatever the next. If Top I'm a Gun VFX artist that did this, I'm coming out right now. It's perfect time to ba basically up my career and my reputation. Get famous. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah. So here too, when the drone, this is an MQ-1C Gray Eagle. If you go Google SIGINT payload, signals intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to find the top hit is MQ-1C Gray Eagle. Um, and over here, you can see when the smoke stacks up, it actually gets darker, just like you would expect from the perspective where the smoke is stacking up. Right. If this was fake, I would imagine that they wouldn't include a detail like this. That's so realistic. Mm, yeah. When the plane, it zooms in here as well, right there, you see actually the clouds get bigger. Some people have argued, well, the clouds are static, but the moment they zoom in, the clouds get bigger. We can see a parallax because the angle of what this drone is looking at the clouds changes slightly as well. Right. So all of this is extremely realistic. We see this realistic interference pattern in the background because again, it's nighttime. So it's like if you were looking at night vision glasses, right? You're going to have this, you're going to see this interference because it's nighttime and that they're trying to, you know, make it look like day. Right. Now the orbs get around it and we're seeing some pretty cool stuff right away. We're seeing yeah. the non-radiating barrier around these orbs, which looks like it's a field of some sort. Like we're not looking at a metal ball here, although we don't know what the shape of the object underneath is but they're creating a field that's separating them from space-time. 
which is allowing them to have essentially zero mass and ignore gravity entirely because we don't see them fall at all. But then they're also just pulling themselves forward on these geodesics that they're be able, able to create here. These black lines are in front of them. Um, and this has been explained by Salvatore Pius, as I'm sure you know, as some type of pulse vibrational effect that is causing a, uh, for lack of a better term, rip in the uh, quantum vacuum energy state. I don't hope I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to get better at the science here, but I know you're far more advanced than I am on that stuff. Uh, and so this pattern here is really wild. It's the reason why they would have added this thermal layer on this Raytheon camera is that they want to show us these details. They right. want to say, Hey, you know, if we had it in black and white, it's not going to be nearly as compelling as what we see here in color. And then when this, if the plane goes off the screen, like this is also weird from a hoax perspective, you would never have the plane going off the screen like this. And when it comes back right. into view, it's zoomed in. The operator is zooming in here and it's going to come back into field of view, zoomed in. And here's where we can see this mm -hmm. heat signature spinning on the axis of the orb. Yep. Bob Greenier said that this is where like this toroidal pattern is creating this uh, byproduct of this heat temperature here. Where, and you probably can help me explain this as well, but that these donut shapes that create a, more donut shapes when you stack them up. This right. is how they can focus the electromagnetic waves to a single point where it can get so strong that it can create a gravitational ripple or a gravitational effect like we yeah. see happening. Come, uh, one trillion percent correct. Uh, high, using high frequency, uh, one trillion percent. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's what's so exciting about these videos is not only I can't even remember a time in the last six years that I've been monitoring UFO videos that I saw two high quality videos from the same exact event from different angles but that have like this geodesic. I've never seen anything like this on any videos where you could actually see it. And I think that's only possible because we're looking at this advanced electro IR camera from Raytheon. Like if we were to look at this through an optical camera, I don't think we would see nearly all these details. We're, we're noticing with the thermal side as well, basically an open system, what's called bulk modulus effect, in other words. So in, normally with an adi uh, adiabatic system, heat is being transferred, say, from you know one part of the system to the other, and it's kind of just repeating itself. But this notion that we can actually use, like the you know Pac-Man's mouth, as we discussed on your show, we can use the local vacuum to then allow for this bulk modulus to cool off while also staying heated simultaneously it speaks to like quantum super positioning so to speak and so mm -hmm. you can then muster up those energy densities that would be needed to create the gravitational effects or ripples in space time that would be done gravitationally to induce what we're seeing here i just wanted to if i could just throw that in there basically because a lot of people say well let's just say this is all you know true and fine and dandy yeah. so, and this goes back to sort of the closed loop perspective of things people will say well you know mass doesn't work like like that or heat cannot behave like that sure mass and heat don't behave like that if you're still going off of the same you know standard u1 models that we've been taught publicly but if we look for example and i don't mean to repeat myself because i've already said it on your show but it has been shown even lee and yang i think it was lee that said and i i'm paraphrasing here but he said we have studied uh we have uh neglected or have left alone the um the potential for exploring the vacuum and so it seems as though that when you explore the vacuum and what could be done, especially if you incorporate uh, basically heavy sides version into uh, uh, from the Maxwell equ equations instead of the traditional uh, standard versions that we have now, we'll see that these open systems can permit basically the amount of, we could say, how can I put it, sort of semi-adiabatic process because again you're using the open system of the vacuum to muster up the necessary energy but you're also using that open part of the system to ensure that you're also interacting with the local vacuum so the heat can still build upon itself to to muster up the necessary volume density and curvature needed to get the effects to get the final whether it's a annihilation or teleportation so uh i just wanted to throw that my two cents in there i appreciate it no definitely um, and so, yeah, so then at the end here, we see this zap happen. It happens very quickly, but the good news is on this old version here, there's also some slowed down versions of it where you can really sure. see the non-radiating barrier here. Sure. And then there's a slowed down version of our zap that happens, this endothermic event. I've right. speculated this endothermic event is absorbing the energy from the lithium ion batteries to put out the runaway lithium ion fire. So it might even be serving a dual, excuse me, purpose, but I can't rule out that there is some uh, 
maybe catalyst involved with their lithium ion batteries. I'm not sure. I'm, sure. You know, I'm not an expert right. at that. But here, I, I like this part a lot because you can see that these orbs actually seem to align towards the, the center of uh, mass of the plane in the final right. moments. Like they're focusing the beams, like cross the streams and Ghostbusters, right? Right. And that this might be what is inducing that singularity. Right. And in the last frame, next frame, you can see here, this frame is very interesting. This is the one right before it gets encompassed by the singularity. Where according to Bob Green here, we can see the azimuth getting formed here. We can see the bending of the orbs that go flat, potentially due to the gravitational lensing effect of this uh, yeah. very strong electromagnetic force they're creating. Yeah. We can see the plane blur, where we never saw blur in any other frames, indicating it's accelerating. And we also see that the plane's gotten a little bit smaller, just a tiny yeah. bit smaller compared to the frame beforehand. Um, and if, if I could say very yeah. quickly, that is, I completely agree with Mr. Green, your statement, in addition to this is what happens when you are either uh, not just reducing the mass of an object or inducing resonance that will change its internal mass by definition. But this is also an interesting situation to see because the velocity of the gravitational velocity is actually by definition dictates the way light uh, we could say uh, behaves and maneuvers. So the speed of light is is um, equivalent or equal to the gravitational velocity, especially when you're inducing second order effects that would then create the blurriness, not just in this uh, particular piece of footage, but also with when people film things with their phones and all that kind of stuff. So this, I just, I cannot emphasize enough that both with what Mr. Green you were saying and with what I, what I am saying, as well as Mr. Paez, I cannot emphasize that point enough as well, because it's one, a handful of things are happening. The orbs and the plane are now going into a higher dimension, basically like a, if we were able to view the Mobius strip in four dimensions instead of three, then the Mobius strip would be able to actually fluidly work. Whereas now in this reality or in this dimension, you kind of have to unfold it yourself to make the Mobius strip keep flowing. And so when I see that effect right there, that was one of the things I have to, I will tell you that I didn't mention on your show that basically did it for me when I said, okay, when I, I saw the vortex, like I saw the caduceus like behavior, but then when I saw the effect of what, what the lensing right before you see it, the plane disappear, I can't emphasize that point enough, both to your audience and to my audience. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's incredible. Cause honestly, part of what I tell other podcasters too, is that I've got scientists, engineers, physicists, and, you know, DOD contractors telling me coming to my DMS and they're telling me this, this validates all my theories, right? It's like, right. What the hoaxer knew science and mathematics and engineering better than the experts know that like is even publicly available. Like to me, this can only be because what we're seeing is actually authentic, right? How many times have you seen have people who had a hoax video where scientists are coming out there going, Oh crap, I got to Go yes. use this to prove my theories. Yes, yes, exactly. No, it's true. And this is what makes me think that perhaps, and I'm not uh, I'm not trying to say this for, uh, because I'm here, but even for others, perhaps it's maybe even more than theories. Perhaps they've done things in the lab that they know mm -hmm. are, are equivalent to what they're seeing in this case. And if I can give one more example of the... The, the the notion of how these orbs can muster up the necessary energy densities to get the effects we're seeing. Um, when we think about that open system concept, it's very much like when you're cooking, for example, uh, pasta or rice or something in a pot and you're boiling the water. And you're going to be able to cook more, longer, and effectively if the lid is slightly removed or completely removed from the pot because the heat has somewhere that it can dissipate into. And then you can therefore have, again, not a closed system, but an open system. Literally, if, if you put that lid back on the pot and then yell to your whole family in your house and said, we can never take the lid off again because that's just the way it's got to be. And if anyone takes that lid off, they're nuts. <laughs> that's basically what's happening in science right now. And so it, probably the best example I could give other than the open Pac-Man mouth would probably be like the, 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 in terms of a simplistic form would probably be like the cooking angle there, if you will. We, we, we have come to believe that, you know, you can only cook with the lid closed, but if you can cook with it open, you can do the effects in an open like system that we saw or that we're seeing in the footage here. Huh. That's an interesting. So, and how do you think that relates to the fact that these lines that we see in front of are cold and they're black, you know, they're black, dark, cold. Do you think that it's absorbing the energy and then therefore reducing the temperature on the output or uh, that's just my 
I, in my my opinion, and I say this speculatively because Mm -hmm. ultimately I can only analyze so far until I have to see it in the lab myself. But I would say in that particular case, what we're seeing is I I believe a, um, how can I put it? Um, Wherever it gets extremely cold, you're going to be able to void the local space time metric essentially. So in my opinion, it could have been some type of laser like effect that was creating a pathway for the geodesics to continue to, to, to flux on. And it would have to be cold by definition because the cold is, it's very similar to like when we have the, uh, the, the, the Meisner effect with superconductors, Mm -hmm. the Meisner effect doesn't work unless it's in it's, it's uh, we could say zero temperature state in its critical state, which is by definition, very cold. So if we took a thermal camera and in the laboratory, and we looked at a superconductor in its normal state versus critical state, you're going to see the very similar cold spots the same way you saw in the footage here. Huh. Interesting. So I think that it, there's, I, I definitely think there's something there. And this would, again, if I can make one more connection, this Please. speaks to uh, Mr. Paez wanting to constantly promote his uh, room temperature superconductor angle, because it's been proposed that the, for example, the likes of uh, Otis T. Carr and others in the 1920s or 30s, they as- allegedly built something similar to the Paez devices, where after a certain uh, threshold was met in the laboratory with these metals, they became cold and therefore room temperature superconductive simultaneously. And that is, some have theorized that, again, that's one of the reasons why there's this push on metamaterials and not saying, hey, maybe we can just use normal pieces of metal to do this stuff. Wow, so that's interesting. And that's yeah. also pretty consistent with Bob Green. you told me where he said that cold fusion doesn't require cold temperatures either, that there may be ways to achieve cold fusion. I, I, I agree with Bob like a trillion. I can't emphasize even that point enough. I agree with Bob a trillion percent. Yeah. And I'm learning so much science here. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I can't decide what's melting my brain more is the videos or the science behind them all in terms of learning <laughs> how it all goes down. But let's go back into some of the mystery and the, and the conspiracy angle here, because Sure. One thing I want to tell your audience, I think is some of the most compelling evidence is the leaker and the identity of the leaker. This is probably some of the most, uh, the investigative work I'm most proud of in general, because I sat here and I was looking at these videos and I'm sitting there going, I think I have a good psychological profile for the person that leaked these. Um, you know, the person was probably U S military personnel, probably an operator, right. probably had an emotional reaction since registered non accounts says they received them four days after the event. They mm-hmm. removed the HUD data from the drone. They colorized that drone footage to give us more detail. They cropped the drone out of the satellite video, which would indicate that they're probably not a spy. They're somebody who's just trying to give us the minimum amount of information to solve the case, especially with the sat- the coordinates left there in the bottom. Um, they probably had to convince Regicide Anon that the videos were real because it says source protected on there. Mm-hmm. And the published date is like nine weeks after the received date. So just like us, when we were looking at these videos firsthand, especially in 2014, we said, nah, this looks, no way it could be real, right? But this person right. goes, no, I'm, I'm a military person. This is what the cyber system looks like. Like this right. is real drone footage, right? Right. Um, so I'm digging around. I'm looking for anybody who had been charged with espionage, will for attention of classified data, will for attention of national security documents, et cetera. I started finding that like these things are very serious. Anyone who's caught trying to steal satellite data, like yeah. even as a contractor, <laughs> they're facing the death penalty. Like this is, yeah. they don't mess around with this kind of stuff. Right. Um, so then I, it took me a couple of weeks. Like it was hard to find this guy. Uh, and I, then I started doing date range searches, be like trying to narrow it down. And I run across Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn. Right away, my spider sense was going wild. I'm seeing signals intelligence in every news article about the guy. Some of the articles are called The Strange Case of Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn. They're trying to get this guy for espionage, but... There's stuff quoting that like the government's not sure they're going to be able to make any of the charges stick. And turns out this guy was part of a special squadron, the VPU-2, which uh, flew in the EP-3 Ares-2, which has real-time tactical SIGINT and motion video intelligence. The crew battle, the crew fuses collected intelligence along with offboard data for battlefield situational awareness. His actual job was taking that data and reporting it to the higher ups. He, the case against him got a code name operation rogue archer, which I don't know. That's just a cool code name. I didn't really realize that in in criminal cases, you give people code names either. (laughs) Um, Right. 
his last deployment, we were able to narrow down the time frame of this so small that it has to be MH370. His final deployment is February 2014, but he gets reassigned suddenly March 25th, 2014, just a month later. This is just two weeks after the plane goes missing. The right. investigation, and we had to piece this together from all kinds of different news articles, like 10 different news articles. We get his lawyer saying the investigation began April 2nd, 2014, which is just a week after he gets reassigned. In May of 2014, he gets caught with two flight manifests in his flight suit from a deployment that included search and rescue code names. To me, it's like Yahtzee. Like that's what other search and rescue could he possibly have been? It's got to be MH370. Right. But that was not, that's not all. <laughs> then the defense argues that the classified information and questions available on the internet. So this is the part where I'm like, okay, that's the videos. Two charges of mishandling classified information. They uh, um, they arrest him in 2015, which my people in MH370X have speculated that they probably waited to arrest him so that it wouldn't be obvious right. that it would tie him to the case, right? Otherwise, the the narrow the time window is going to be too short. It's going to people are going to be able to figure it out way too quickly. They're going to be like. Why did this guy get arrested right after MH370 goes missing? Unfortunately, right? from a malevolent perspective, you want to leave just enough plausibility, but you also want to, quote unquote, pick these people up fairly quickly. So that, that one yep. month time frame seems like a perfect balance. And that's funny because I'm sitting here thinking like they are going to catch this guy right away. But then I'm thinking as well that, you know, the case against him might take like a year or more and all the dates were starting to line up as well. They try right. to run an FBI sting operation on him. I'm, fairly certain they try to get him to sleep with this woman and, and tell information to this FBI informant. And uh, they end up charging him with espionage charges that would have resulted in life in prison. First major incident of espionage by an active duty member of the Navy since the end of the cold war, almost 50 years, Whoa. his entire charge sheet, like everything's redacted, all the dates, names, everything related to it, all redacted. We were trying to figure out, maybe we can find the dates that'll match up with the videos, but they redact right. everything. Um, he was privy to the Navy's uh, black program portfolio with above top, se top, top secret clearance and compartmentalized access to information. Uh, he was friends with General Flynn on Facebook. That's just a fun little note. I mean, so this guy was pretty connected. I, other stuff I looked into said they were pretty much fast tracking him. Um, he had spent 18 years as a dedicated uh, officer in the Navy. They trusted him with the with nukes and you know, this guy was somebody that they really like had high hopes for. Um, right. He had knowledge it would be extremely useful to potential adversaries. But then, as I mentioned, they couldn't prove it was really a spy case. Mm. So there was actually no evidence he exchanged anything from, with anyone from China. He was a naturalized Taiwanese American. Um, he was abused in pretrial detainment by the goon squad. They, when he was under interrogation, he, they wouldn't give him his charges. They wouldn't tell him what he was being charged with. When they were holding him in pretrial detainment, uh, the judge made a statement that he was like too risky to be let out, but they just put like mundane emails as the evidence for it, which would implicate that they couldn't show the real evidence, which is the videos, right? right? They couldn't even talk about it because any of this is going to leak out. So they had to throw all these bogus charges like prostitution on there. The prostitution thing was super weird. The defense even argued that uh, the government was just manipulating the media with falsehoods about the guy. Um, so there's this, all this evidence that they were obfuscating the real charges. Right. Um, and then he ended up taking a plea deal, spends 600 in like 36 days, I believe it is, in pretrial detainment until he ends up taking a plea deal. In the plea deal, he pleads to just the two charges he was actually guilty of. And he gets nine years for two charges of mishandling classified data, which is a long, long time. Other people that I looked up when I was doing this investigation, mm. they got like slaps on the wrist for mishandling classified data. This guy gets nine years and then they shave off three years because he agrees to work with the NCIS and the FBI. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to FOIA these people. And I FOIA right. the FBI and NCIS and I say, give me everything. And I also put in the reason that it's in the public interest to expedite it because I know that this guy's tied to MH370 and know the truth. I don't know if that was the smartest move to put on there, <laughs> but I went ahead and did it anyway. Right. And the NCIS rejected my FOIA in total. They wouldn't give me anything about the case at wow. all. Wow. Not anything. They're not even going to redact it. I'm just going to pull it up so I can read it. Sure. 
You know, as dear Mr. Forbes, this responds to your November 2nd Freedom of Information Act request seeking the copy of NCIS investigation concerning Edward C. Lynn. We received your request on November 2nd. A search of our collective databases identified one 2014 investigation response to your request. We've carefully reviewed the documents and withheld them in total under FOIA exemption C US uh, 5 USC 552B1 exemption one. Uh, protects from disclosure information about quote unquote matters specifically authorized under the criteria established by an executive order to be kept secret in the interest of national defense or foreign policy. I looked this up and this is an Obama era executive order. He actually loosened FOIA requests to make them easier to get. But some of the exemptions are like the stuff that's super classified that nobody can have access to. Since this wasn't a spy case, I don't understand how the foreign policy angle would come into play unless it's because of MH370. So again, everything is pointing to this guy being the leaker and these videos being real. So I just wanted to throw that out there for your audience because I think that it's just, at this point, so overwhelming amount of evidence. Well, I, just from a scientific perspective, to me, the evidence is overwhelming. The heat signatures, the different, the cold, uh, cold spots, all these different things are... are 100% there that align identically with the things that I'm familiar with, like I've said a, a hundred times since I've been on your show in the, in the laboratory. But uh, yeah, that this is just, I've been taking some notes as to some of the things that you've been, you've been pointing out. And this has actually been leaving me with some more, uh, it, it's making me want to want to join you on some of these Twitter spaces at some point to, to, to discuss this with others, because I, I, to be honest with you, man, I don't really have any questions simply because <laughs> you've literally hit every single angle and every question that I was going to ask you addressed it along the way of your uh, analysis and breakdown. So yeah, I just, I, I don't mean to, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to say uh, if I may, because you've done such an eloquent job here. I've checked off all my questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that's why I think a lot of people give me praise in general is just that I look at it from a scientific perspective and I right. really try to have the evidence break down in a way that will be comprehensible to people that may not be familiar with the case. And sometimes the people who are familiar, that just want to know some of those more elaborate details. Mm. And what I really was hoping to talk to you about is stuff that I don't get to talk about a lot of people, which is what does this all mean, right? For us as a civilization, sure. you know, you're somebody who understands, I think the science behind it to be authentic and potentially understands those implications. What I have been telling and asking these uh, UAP names, and I've been talking to people that are like the OGs of the UAP phenomenon. Right. Right. And I always ask them the same question because when I was familiar with UAPs, it was all about UAPs turning off nukes, preventing us from destroying ourselves, stuff like that. And right. then I started looking at this technology and I'm like, wait, this is not nukes anymore we're talking about. We're talking about doomsday weapons. We're talking about one person having the ability to blow up whole countries, if not the whole planet. And so I asked them, you know, is disclosure still worth it if these implications are true? Right. And most of the response I get back is pretty consistent. Some people say, you know what, this is this is too dark. I don't want the whole plan to blow up. Right. Other people come back and say it's up to us as humanity to, you know, figure that out ourselves, essentially. And right. that's why I come back and say, well, this is in my mind, we have to be very responsible about how we release this information, even right. us right now as we're talking about it, yep. uh, because I think there's a lot of good that can come from it. Uh, but I think there's a lot of risk. So first, I would ask you, what are your thoughts are on that? And then I'd just like to have a, a quick casual conversation about maybe some of the implications of what this type, type of technology could lead to on, on the positive side. Sure, sure. Well, first off, let me just say thank you so much for, for asking, because uh, I know this time around uh, you're, you're on my show. So I want to thank you so much for, <laughs> for turning it back around on me. And I think that um, I think ultimately one thing that I want to emphasize that I that I brought up again probably about an hour ago was that when we were looking at the satellite aspect of this, um, I think that this this technology I think we're at the point where if we keep it hidden any longer, then it's only going to create more and more issues that will, I say this with hoping it wouldn't happen, but it would only create issues that make the three, uh, <clears throat> that make the 370 flight look like, uh, like a firecracker compared to some of the things that this tech could do. With that said, I think that uh, disclosure is there for those who look. Now, the me of two years ago would have had a different answer, but I think that the revelation of this tech and knowledge more so should come out. I don't think it should be something that it's like, hey, just grab it off the shelf and bring one home for yourself, because then you're just on, on mathematical probability, you're guaranteeing we're going to destroy ourselves if you give the average person this type of uh, power to wield. Um, although we could 
make an argument that the ones that currently wield it are doing more damage than the average person would if they had it. But with that said, I think that when we, I think there's no, I'm going to be very uh, pragmatic and re as real as I can. I don't necessarily, I think in the short term, there's no good way that this looks when it comes out, because no matter what, it's, there's always going to be an angle of what you've had this for how long and you've kept it hidden. And that's just the, that's just the beginning. Right. Yeah. And so I think there's no good way this can come out. The question is, how do we mitigate it to make it the mitigate the current scenario and environment to shape a situation where it's the least shittiest way to be revealed, basically. That's in my humble opinion, I think that's sort of the the situation we're in. Now, on the positive side, what this does is I, I can't even put into I think it, what I'm about to say is an understatement. Communication, transportation, medical healing, the uh, I dare I even say the longevity of letting our bodies surpass that of the average, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 year age threshold um, going into maybe living for hundreds of years two, 300 years, for example, the amount of 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 tech uh, of of capability and benefits that this can provide to people. To the point where it's you want to go see your, you know, your loved one overseas or across the country or something, you walk through a Stargate like it's a doorway and you're at their house, you know, so th there are things like this and I'm, I'm just I'm getting goosebumps in a good way because the amount of beauty that can come from this is incredible incredible especially when things like space and time don't actually have a meaning or a value relative to you in the sense that you can go what normally would have taken rocket propulsion a thousand years you can get you can just walk just like walking through a doorway you can end up at that location for example i think it's i think it's phenomenal um i think that at the end of the day though and i I can't believe I'm saying this, but I want to be as honest with you and and especially uh, with the members in my audience as possible. But I don't claim to have the answer, but I, from the things just I have seen in the laboratory, there has to be a way that this is, how can I put it? Um, We need to be careful who we give it to, if I'm being honest with you. And with that said, some people will say, well, Dave, do you think that you can be trusted with it? And what I say to that is, no, uh, I again, whether people want to believe it or not, I've been in fortunate enough situations or scenarios where I have been uh, potentially privy to some of this hardware, if you will. But it's the hardware itself is is not even anything special, so to speak. It's it's what you do to to the to the metal or to the aluminum or to the, you know what the piezoelectric uh, material or the magnesium bismuth or etc. Mm -hmm. etc. Et so hopefully i addressed the questions or answered them in in a satisfactory manner brother but that's probably the best answers i could give because unfortunately there's no um i i do totally see where people are coming from when they say like this stuff is just way too dark for me or whatever um yeah. because it's it's um it speaks to philosophy and i think even spirituality which is that for all the beautiful things we have to take into account the negative possibilities as well and we've mm -hmm. only been seeing this tech and science be used for uh, very subtle, malevolent purposes. So other than blowing ourselves up in the world, I really don't think it could get any worse right now, which is why I'm all for bringing a lot of it out. With that said, that doesn't mean, hey, just, you know, just start selling it at Walmart or something like this. I'm yeah. talking about a very controlled way of bringing it out. And I hope that the ones that do bring it out are um, are trusted in that sense of being able to be the controllers of 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 disclosing it. Now, Mm -hmm. Will it be some type of organized, would do I prefer some type of organized disclosure where it comes from one entity or group? No, I would, pr I would prefer something where it's like, hey, you know, someone discovered something in this laboratory in, you know, Sweden, someone else in America discovered something, somebody else in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, South Africa discovered something. And the reason I bring that up is because what that does is it decentralizes the control structure. And so then we can sort of have people kind of keeping each other at an even keel in terms of the scientists that may get access to this stuff and want to be responsible with it in the laboratory and things like that. Um, because as of right now, it, under the assumption that this is on, in the hands of private contractors, uh, they can literally do whatever the fuck they want, literally. So, yeah, yeah that's hopefully hopefully that's that's a, a good enough um, answer on both ends. But that's probably the best opinion uh, realistically I can give at the moment. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I love your opinions, of course. I think that uh, I would love to live for another hundred years if we have the medical healing capability to do that. Although I get more and more the feeling that I'm, I'm not going to live to uh, die of natural old age, but <laughs> we'll see how the future plays out. 
Um, the other thing I think is interesting to bring up for your audience as well is that, you know, we've had these UAP hearings that have been right. going on. And I, I think it's time to move away from the UAP hearings and move towards the conspiracy hearings of why this technology has been kept hidden from us, right? right. And I don't think when we frame it under this guise of aliens coming in and visiting us, you know, I think that that tunes a lot of people out. When you frame it under this, uh, the notion of we have this advanced technology that we have, uh, you know, since we split the atom, been working right. on, right. whether yeah. or not that's reverse engineered or not, that's what right. people then go, oh, okay, this is why miles per gallon in cars haven't changed. This is why we're still using rocket propulsion, right. you know, et cetera, is that this is all being hidden from us. That I think will get more traction. And from listening to congressmen and, and women in office, you know, I was just looking at the Matt Gates quote from the UAP hearing. He actually posted mm -hmm. the same clip that I posted several days ago um, where he's talking about one of his sightings. And one thing he says that disturbed me is that, well, a couple things. He says that he's the only one who had seen some of these videos in the entire Congress. And then he also says that it must be non-human technology. And that's the part where I'm going, wait, does he not even realize how advanced our third party contractors even are? Because right. yeah, yeah. You know, that's what concerns me about it. It's like, I don't think even Congress understands, like we're talking about like these Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman's, et cetera, like are actually have technology that is our technology now right. that isn't just coming from non-human intelligence. I'm, well, if I could say very quickly to add to your point to support it, as a matter of fact, and this actually, thanks for setting the stage for this, because a lot of people, um, both internally and externally, have been asking me my opinion on, for example, the big, uh, you know, the stories that broke about the CIA having some recovery office, and then, you know, uh, yep. Tucker Carlson having uh, Congressman Burchett on. Um, I, I disagree very adamantly with Mr. Carlson's introduction that evening to his, uh, to his premiere. Um, and the reason I do is because... Uh, I would rather that he have presented multiple angles of this reality than just one. And in my opinion, it would be exactly what you said, which is that we must always leave open the possibility for something that is outside of what many of our core competences of understanding and absorption. But we also must acknowledge the fact that or the potential fact, and I say that just because, you know, nothing's quote unquote officially proven, I guess, but that these third party contractors um are residing on these uh on uh, are residing on this technology and have this technology sitting in warehouses whether above ground underground uh, literally metaphorically and that is one of the things that i would have basically either replaced or added into mr carlson's speech which is basically we can't say just because oh my gosh this is so out there that it's not human we can't really make those conclusions now i've said this before to both to you privately and even publicly if you're looking to um, dist uh, distract from the fact that the contractors have been sitting on this stuff and you're looking to try and create another avenue of where we as a society stumble upon to a limited degree some of this stuff, the introduction that Mr. Carlson gave, I think, was very adamant and accurate. But if we want to open up the, the the full reality of things, that contractors have had this for many decades, long before I've been around and even yourself, then I think I would have personally changed the opening intro to that. Yeah, no, I actually agree with you in terms of uh, I watched that interview as well with uh, Tucker Carlson and, and Bruce. Yeah. And I hope one day I get to talk to Tucker Carlson because I'll bring that point up with him. Well, can I just say, say very quickly, you did a beautiful job, in my opinion, when you went on Alex Jones and you brought up uh, when he asked you near the end there what you think this is a result of. And you did a very nice job of breaking down the different, uh, we could say, silos, which some of it may be truly, you know, ET, interdimensional, crypto terrestrial, whatever you want to call it chunk of it is is dod contractors and then a lot of it has to a lot of the silence comes from these life-threatening ndas and i really mm -hmm. i really honestly as someone who's has one foot on the inside in a certain aspect i appreciate your conveying it in that way because it's not like you're saying okay you know alex or tucker or whoever it's just this and it's got to be that and that's it you yeah. know so yeah and that's what concerns me though about you know even the congress like Ber or uh, um, gates and and maybe you know um, right. luna and burchette and moshwitz as well think the same thing in terms of talking with Tucker, tucker is this idea that oh it's all alien technology but you right. know, i think we have to start coming to terms with the fact that this is our technology now whether or not we got it from reverse engineering like we have this out there and the, then the question should be how are we going to use this to reshape our world I think that a lot of people get stuck in this idea that humanity is at the pinnacle of science right now. Right. When really, I would argue that we are simply cavemen, you know, in the same right. way that cavemen defend, create our discovering fire, think that they're at the pinnacle of society. Right. 
right? Where, yes, that's a huge advancement for their society if you're living in caves, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's not nearly as far as we can push the limits. So, you know, that's yeah. what I would say for in kind of in closing, you know, what, uh, what we should be thinking about. 100%. And I also noticed as well, uh, when you graciously had me on, there were some people asking in the comments if I thought uh, as to whether or not the orbs were ours or not. And just if I could address it now, sure. I'm, I would, I would, I'm not a betting man, but I would bet big money that those are ours and probably Lockheed's. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all pointing at Lockheed. It's like, hey, Lockheed, it's getting awkward over here. Uh, what you right. got, you know? And, right, uh, right. Yeah, so I hope we get to the truth here someday in the future. And I've appreciated talking to you today for sure. Thank you. And please, before you go, Ashton, if you could please yeah. let my members and then when this goes public, let everyone know where and how you could be found. I know yep. it's not hard to find you these days. A Google, a search, you're there all over the place. Yeah. But if you could please, it doesn't hurt to let everyone know. Yeah, just in case Google does, the uh, results are changing quickly. Then, um, yeah, you find me at, at JustXAshton. Uh, I think pretty consistently that you can find me on Twitter, X Corp uh, now as well as YouTube. I started this YouTube where I actually had you on my podcast uh, last week uh, doing the hard truths. I've been streaming almost every single night now. We've been having a great time doing uh, super advanced science and then flipping it over to do some memes on the side to just kind of you know shake it up. And then uh, you can also find me on uh, Instagram. I think that my handle is at JustXAshton there or maybe JustAshton. Um, but you'll be able to find me and some of the shorts that uh, videos I've been producing on uh, Instagram as well. So if you want to follow on the case, you can find me at any of those three places. But just for my audience, could you let them know very quickly in a general way what scientific topics you guys touch on during those spaces? I think some of them would probably want to know. Yeah. So um, you mean in the spaces that I've been doing, I've mostly been doing the evidence review, but... Okay. With respect to um, some of the stuff we're going in the streams, like we're going in Salvatore right. Pius science and patents and scientific papers that he's been putting out there. Uh, right. I was actually just adding it to my evidence just, just now, which is the high frequency gravitational wave generator, right. things like that, that actually discuss a lot of those implications that we were talking about here. I mean, he just lays awesome. it out right in the papers where if you were to look at that, or even I were to look at that a few years ago, I would have said, huh, this is kind of like futurology. And now I'm looking at him right. going, wow, okay. He's just telling us exactly the stuff that we're seeing in these videos. Right. And, um, right. And then the other one, I think was the like uh, super luminal speeds, which is what we would need to be able to go faster than the speed of light. And then the last one I'm going to say incorrectly, but I think it's like high energy electromagnetic field generator uh, is might be the last one. I could be wrong. No, I think you said H E E M F G. I think you said it right. Yeah. Did I say it right? Okay. Yeah. Oh boy. I'm getting, yeah. I'm getting scary, uh, comfortable with all this stuff at this point, <laughs> but that's how we can induce very high uh, energy densities that can allow for this breakdown of the vacuum state of uh, space time. So, you know, these are which very advanced concepts. Very quickly, which Please. would lead to creating those cold spots that you see in the footage. There we go. Yeah. So it all starts to come together, right? And I hope that the academics and the open-minded people out there look into these scientific concepts because I am fully 100% confident that time will vindicate all of this and prove right. it to all be real. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. You, as you know, uh, uh, I'm there to support you completely in hundred percent and all the way. And I look forward to even our, uh, as of the day we're recording this, we have tomorrow our uh, a panel with you, me and, and Mr. Paez. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be an absolute blast. And I want to thank you so much again for coming on. I know that you've laid your case out as particularly the first, say 40 minutes of this recording many times over. So I appreciate the fact that you have the, uh, the patience to do it. I know a lot of people say, Hey man, just watch this video. I laid it out 50 <laughs> times already, but I think that's also what a lot of people uh, respect and appreciate appreciate about you is that you're willing to engage with the with various communities online and even in person and and go through it step by step over and over again and i i appreciate that uh, and i i'm sure i speak on behalf of others when i say we appreciate that so thank you so much no no problem i enjoy it so cheers everyone. Lot, sir. thank Bye. you